The last couple of years have been interesting. I've uh, endeavoured to take sustainability frameworks um, to project management, uh, and in particular by being a project manager. I figured out uh, in my work with Glenn that um, trying to put uh, sustainability frameworks into projects relied on being able to get the say-so of the project manager. And it turns out that if you happen to be the project manager, it's a lot easier argument. So that's the way, um, that's the way that went. <coughs> Um, uh, but I'll, I'll move into, into today's topic ar ar around the commons. I've, I've actually done an, an off-hatch, uh, uh, off-CSRP, uh, um, off um, a bit of research uh, in collaboration with somebody in the United States. And um, I, uh, I've been doing that because I feel it has some relevance to uh, extraction industries and the way that they um, interact with the commons. So what I mean by the commons is, is that common property that we all enjoy, the, the, the fresh air, the, the nice rivers, and all of those sorts of things. And I know that in the context of coal seam gas, um, there's been uh, an, a, an intersection or an interaction of the parties that has been uh, uh, sometimes not very smooth. So that's why it's been uh, interesting to me. So I'll uh, move to my first uh, slide. Um, <coughs> which uh, looks a little bit complex, but uh, several years ago I, uh, I, I thought about um, the intractable nature of the salts that uh, occur in the coal seam gas water that uh, is extracted um, uh, ahead of and during the extraction of gas from the wells. And uh, uh, at the time there was uh, um, restrictions growing uh, in government to the ability to store that water and to evaporate it and to leave the salts behind. And this uh, diagram was somewhat of an industrial ecology approach to how we might address the salts that lie in that water. So I'll just uh, move a little bit around. So as everybody I'm sure would know that coal seam gas uh, producers, the companies are interested in selling natural gas to, uh, to an LNG company who would then export it in Australia's case. That's their core business, that's what they would like to do. Uh, unfortunately, when they extract from the, uh, the coal seam gas fields in uh, western Queensland, uh, they get this, all this water, and the water very often uh, has a high salt loading. So you end up with uh, a relatively intractable problem where they must desalinate the water to be able to use it beneficially, um, and that leaves them with the brine. And uh, you can do some desalinate. Uh, there's fairly simple technologies, uh, well-known technologies, to do that desalination, as I'm sure you're aware. So I was thinking about what you might do with the water and with the brine at this time. So I'm talking about uh, 2009, um, 2008, 9, 10. <coughs> and um, let's deal with the water first. Uh, clearly, a farmer might like to use excess water that might, he might not otherwise um, have access to. But one of the problems with, uh, with coal seam gas fields is that they move, or rather that the, whole, that the holes that are currently under production are not necessarily the holes that are going to be in production in two, three, five years' time. So although you might uh, produce some water in a particular locality, after a short time it moves, and you're having to move it further and further. So my thought was, well, uh, why don't we use that water for a beneficial use in farming. And uh, one of the things that I was dealing with at the time was pyrolysis of, of biomass to create uh, some sort of improvement for soil fertility and uh, in the form of a biochar. And biochar is becoming more and more uh, an accepted means of improving soil fertility as we, uh, uh, through those years, improvements of the soil fertility. And uh, that would then lead me to the conclusion that if, uh, if the farmer was able to improve the soil, then later on when the water is no longer available, then the soil is more robust and that, uh, that farmer can continue to use their farm for the improved, the improved purpose. You can, uh, you can of course, uh, supplement that with other things like uh, red mud and so on from a, the alumina refinery that sits on our coastline. That's another way to improve things. So let's move to the water side. Um, I, be, I beg your pardon, the brine side. Um, and at the time, uh, a, a modified solvay process might well have been used for uh, creating uh, um, a beneficial use for the brine. 
uh, sodium carbonates perhaps, uh, you would need to import lime. And then uh, the calcium chloride could also be used by that alumina refinery I spoke of earlier. So in the end, you end up with a, um, a fairly intricate uh, industrial ecology platform for improving the use of water and brine um, in the coal seeding gas industry. Fantastic. So uh, everybody at Hatch was pretty uh, enthusiastic about this, uh, the, the growth of this idea. And uh, I suggested that we might be able to investigate this and do uh, some basic engineering, perhaps, and costings and so on. And uh, everybody at Hatch thought that was a great idea, and off I went to, to, to see if I could do that. Um, I started with government, who thought it was a fantastic idea as well. So the Department of This, That and the Other um, thought, yes, that's fantastic, because we've been trying to get the coal seam gas uh, producers to collaborate in, in some sort of pre-competitive way for quite some time to address this problem. So they uh, supported the idea and uh, we had joint meetings with several of the producers and the producers listened very politely and then went away and did absolutely nothing about it. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm talking about 2009, 2010 now. And the conclusion was that um, there was no real incentive for them to collaborate. The, uh, um, the leverage that they had was of course was lots of jobs and lots of income and uh, uh, and the, the notion that you would hold up a, uh, a coal seam gas um, industry because of some salt lying around was probably a bridge too far, perhaps. Anyway, we got nowhere with it, and, uh, and so that sort of uh, went on the back burner. However, it got me thinking uh, um, about things. So this is just the same diagram, but with uh, the electricity added on the top, I won't... Uh, I won't go too far there. Um, some months ago, uh, I, uh, I had some discussions uh, while I was doing a little bit of work at the University of Southern Queensland um, uh, in the sugar industry, and it brought back memories of the coal seam gas. Uh, that's because they have um, obviously a lot of additives to their farms, and those additives can run off, and uh, the rivers that they run off into um, eventually impact on the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And there is, uh, there, there is an understanding that improvements are required to avoid um, some regulatory intervention, such as taxes or trading schemes, to limit um, the, uh, uh, the levels of, of fertiliser that escape into, into the river systems. So, um, with that in mind, and thinking about coal seam gas, um, I, I, I was wondering, you know, what would, uh, what would we uh, be able to do? Turning now to um, a third part of the, uh, the puzzle. <coughs> so Vermont, as I'm sure you're aware, is a state in the northeastern part of um, the United States. <coughs> and they have a, um, currently have a bill in their legislature so I'm going to um, read a little bit from, uh, from uh, a paper that uh, e explains this. Um, they talk about uh, common assets trusts, and a common assets trust is a legal entity um, with explicit obligations to protect, manage, and create common assets for the common good of present and future generations. It sounds very much about a, sustain a sustainable approach to the commons. And uh, the Vermont Legislature is considering the creation of a Verm Vermont Common Assets Trust, or VCAT, uh, that would make the state's atmosphere, aquifers, and other resources created by nature or by society as a whole the common property. So now I'm thinking, well, how does that apply to coal seam gas and, uh, and, and the sugar industry? And uh, there are common assets that get affected by both of those industries, such as rivers and... Uh, um, river systems, catchments, um, and indeed in, in the gas fields, uh, farmers, farms, and, uh, and, and communities. <coughs> Furthermore, in this uh, VCAT, uh, revenue from the what they term propertization and rent capture could be used to fund expenditure by the state on public goods and other social benefits. In other words, extracting a revenue from the users of the of the common property for the common good. And 
that then got me thinking into some work that I've been doing since 2005-06 uh, with my friend in the United States around, okay, so if that, if that works, then that's also potentially going to work in a slightly different way. We had been working around a very similar theme, but we had a couple of uh, interesting differences which I think make what, what Vermont are trying to do a little better. So what we think is that um, if you use property rights as the, as the foundation for creating such common assets, then that's fantastic, except if you use the fees just generally for the public good, then that's just like a tax. It's no different really from a carbon tax, say, where you extract the, uh, you extract the fee uh, and then use it in general revenue. It also lacks what we call the firm and it lacks claims and expenses, which I'll go into in a moment. And, and, and hopefully when I, uh, when I do that, you'll, you'll see why we think that uh, a, a common property rights uh, framework uh, with, a, with a few tweaks from where the VCAT is, um, it, it is a better outcome. So I'll just take you through this little family tree of, of property. Um, property is, uh, is, is something that's been developed over the millennia uh, of human existence. And so basically from left to right is somewhat chronological order and there's families of the way property is organised. And so I'll just take you very quickly through this. I'll just zoom in a little bit. So um, if you can imagine uh, traditional societies in a hunter-gatherer mode um, had very little private property. It was all communal. And even then they had very little property itself because it's very difficult to, to take it with you if you're in a traditional society. So very much uh, regionally based or family based type property ownership. Uh, a little bit, well, a little bit later, after the invention of agriculture, we managed to develop society in such a way that we ended up with, if you like, um, uh, models that were quite small scale. There was no big government involved, but nevertheless, it was more sophisticated than the hunter gatherer. So things like city states and feudalism evolved. And eventually um, there was uh, advances on that around property, still no big government. And in the modern era, that is, uh, that is still with us in the form of things like kibbutz and, uh, and community-based management. So community-based management is something quite prevalent in Asia, particularly in India and, uh, and Southeast Asia, where there are, common, there are common assets that are owned by multiple parties. Uh, for the good of the community. And I'm thinking in particular of things like a common water tank for a village, which would be used as a, um, um, uh, for irrigation of multiple farms, and it's owned by individuals in common. That, that uh, area of research is well, ta uh, well, uh, well documented by the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who's, uh, a, uh, who was, um, she's not with us anymore, she died last year. Um, a Nobel Prize winning um, researcher in the area of common, common property. But that's a different common property than the one I'm going to talk about. That's uh, property owned in common. The one I want to talk about is the commons. So that's no reliance on central government. And of course we now know the majority of the world has large governments. So what, how does that handle? There are four, four streams. So firstly, there's direct management, both private and common property. So the, the uh, directly managed private property approach of large government is pretty much communism. So it's centrally organised property owned by the government and, uh, and you get um, permission to use the property from the central government. And they decide who and, uh, and there's, no, there's no trading, there's no free trade of, of that property. And in particular you can, uh, you can think of, of land as the, as the most, um, most obvious one of those. In a communist state, you can't own property. So um, other things are there as well, such as dependent corporations and so on. But the one that in Australia we're, that we are much more familiar with is the direct management by large government of common property. So if we take um, national parks and things like that and the, the issue of polluting um, rivers and so on, that's handled by um, a direct management approach by our government. 
So if you like end of pipe regulations, beginning of pipe regulations, and indeed if number four right at the bottom there is market-based instruments. Those market-based instruments I'm talking about are generally in two categories. One is a Pigovian tach, a tax, such as a carbon tax, or a cap and trade type trading scheme. So those are the currently the preferred methods of dealing with common property and the internalization of external costs. <coughs> And as we know, they're not all that successful, at least not yet. Um, so the European Carbon Trading Scheme has, uh, has run into difficulties and there's enormous opposition to our own carbon tax. And um, uh, we tried a cap and trade idea to start with and that got defeated and, and now it's a carbon tax. So that is large government direct management of the private and common property. I'll move it across the screen a little. <clears throat> so now this is still large government, but now it's indirect management of private and common property. So the one on the left, the private property rights indirectly managed are the ones that we all enjoy. I suspect the majority of people in this room either own or intend to own their own home. And by owning our own home, that means that we have the exclusive right to occupy a piece of land for a particular purpose, a dwelling normally. And that can be traded because we have confidence in the system. We can buy and sell that amongst each other. Government has, doesn't get involved other than setting up the framework. We don't have to get permission from our, from our politicians to buy and sell our house. We only have to abide by certain rules that have been set up. Corporations can, bu can buy and sell property as well, and it doesn't have to be just land, it can be all sorts of things. Televisions and motor cars and, uh, and other corporations can be bought and sold on the free market without government interference. That's the most successful framework for property management that the world has ever seen. It has, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it has spread throughout the world. There's, I, I, I don't know the number, but I'm imagining that 95% of uh, the world's assets are handled through a private property system such as that. But we have no such analogy in common property. All common property in the world is handled through large government directly managed, not indirectly managed. And so that is the, the area of interest that we have. How do we, make, how do we make the environment part of our system, part of the economic system in fact? That private property system is in fact the way that our economic system is based. And if you think back to why I had so much difficulty getting our gas producers interested in an industrial ecology framework for handling the issues of salt and water, <coughs> it's because there's no place in the economy for common, the commons. So where's my research taking, taking this? Um, I, I must, uh, at, at this point, recognize my colleague in the United States, Mr. Jack Harrick. He's been working on uh, uh, the, the detail of this research for quite some time. And uh, um, I think what he's come up with is, is rather marvelous. Um, it's my job to put it into a, uh, a, a broader research context. <coughs> so I'm going to take you through four quick slides um, here on what that, ha what that research um, is proposing um, and then link it to the, the VCAT, the, the Vermont uh, situation. So the first graph here represents um, one output from the work of, of a Peruvian researcher called Hernando de Soto. He, uh, he has done um, an awful lot of work in, uh, in the way that um, property private property, houses and land is handled in third world countries as opposed to how it's handled in, in the first world. And in particular, he took five cities around the world, Lima and uh, Manila uh, being the obvious two. Lima is his hometown and this graph is the one from Manila and tried to understand why it was so difficult to um, have uh, disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged people own their own home. And in the five cities that he chose, there was a common theme. Extraordinarily long and arduous steps for formalizing those, those property transactions. 
So in Manila, 168 steps to buy a piece of land, taking somewhere between 13 to 25 years and costing many, many years' salary for, the, for an average person. He put this down as a root cause of why there are so many informal settlements in cities such as Rio de Janeiro, Manila, Lima, Johannesburg, and I forget the fifth one. <coughs> if it takes that long and it's that difficult to buy a chunk of how long does it take us to buy a house? We can get it over and done with in about six weeks if we really, if, if we really try hard, right? These poor people take years and years and years, which means that it excludes most people. The only people who can afford to take the time and to buy property are the very well connected or the very wealthy who can circumvent those, those number of years. And that's why you have informal settlements. It's much, much easier for you to go and buy a property in a favela and pay the mob much less money to look after your interests. So De Soto was, uh, was, was a bit of, um, was a, bit of a, a revelation to me. And his work really illustrates Coase's theory of the firm. So from 1932, I think Coase uh, 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 had a landmark uh, publication around the theory of the firm. And the theory of the firm talks about firms appearing, so companies and, and other organisations appearing when there's an opportunity to lower transactions costs. So those 168 steps and those number of years is all about transactions costs. That has nothing to do with the cost of the actual piece of land that you're buying. It has to do with the cost of actually buying it. And uh, um, it's extraordinarily expensive in this circumstance. And we, we have very much um, lowered transactions costs in Hatch. Uh, we're t uh, around about, actually, we're a little less than 10,000 people right at the moment, probably about 9,000 or perhaps even less uh, people who uh, sell services to the, uh, to the mining uh, and infrastructure and energy in industries. And if there was 8,000 of us running around trying to individually sell our time to those, those companies, we, there would be a huge cost. But we gather together as a firm and we sell our collective abilities in one hit to each customer. A lot lower transactions costs. So that's, that's the basis of the theory. How do we lower transactions costs for the commons? So we do it in private property. It's the most successful way of doing it in the Western world at least. How do we do it for the commons? If you were to take a look at the typical way a sustainability, a sustainability problem is solved, it has got multiple steps and they're different every time. Environmental activists have no way to lower their transactions costs. So every time you want to save a river or stop a forest being chopped down, you have to go through all sorts of steps over a long period of time, just like the Lima Johannesburg and Manila example of informal properties. And so with that thought, my friend Jack has created the thought that, well, let's try and lower transactions costs for the commons. And VCAT is most of the way there. So I'll, I'll change that slide to this slide. If we could eliminate all of those, those transaction steps on the left-hand side and create a different system that uh, reduced all of those steps, we would have effectively lowered those transactions costs. So the sentence at the bottom of that slide is, transactions costs can be an order of magnitude lower with common property rights because now most common property management transactions occur within the boundary of a firm. And we're gonna call those firms stewards. You may have noticed I used the word steward on that property, um, property tree. Think of stewards as stewardship corporations. So this has some commonality with VCAT, but at the margins, there's some important differences. So there are seven steps towards creating such a thing as a stewardship corporation and having it being able to do what, uh, what, I'm, what we're proposing. The first step is we need legislation, but of course we have really good legislation, at least in the Western world, uh, to treat private property rights. And a lot of that is transferable. We need to create non-profit stewardship corporations who would then make a claim on an unclaimed property. For example, you might want to 
uh, make a claim on the wise stewardship of a river system. Um, assuming there's more than one steward making a claim on that, then the government picks the most appropriate one and then sets, together with that steward, targets for bringing that river system into um, its safe zone. In other words, if it's being over, overused or overpolluted, then there must be a safe zone for that river system. And that would be the target for the stewardship corporation. It has to be non-profit to avoid a conflict of interest. Uh, but you would have a stewardship corporation that would have employees that would run uh, this property. So the property right is not an ownership of the, of the land, it's merely owning the right to manage wisely for the, for the, for the betterment of the environment and, and, and uh, society in general. To do that they must charge fees. Okay, so here is the replacement for a tax or a trading scheme, it's the charging of fees by a steward. It's the same as, same as VCAT is expecting this to, to do, but those fees should be used for the betterment of that, um, that river system or whatever it is that you're making a claim on. For instance, you would charge fees to farmers who pollute the river, you would charge fees to an industrial facility that might be polluting the river, and uh, with those accumulated fees, you would then direct that towards, first of all, your own salaries, of course, and uh, the costs associated with running your firm. But the excesses after that would be used for things that better enable you to manage. In other words, perhaps some research and development, perhaps a, um, um, a water treatment plant that would, uh, or, or several uh, water treatment plants, or barriers to the pollution, or things that could be bought collectively rather than individually by the polluters. That drives the incentives for the polluters to either reduce the pollution themselves and avoid paying the fee, or to accept that the fee has to be paid and collaborate in, in a joint effort to reduce that. The big difference between that and what VCAT is, uh, is, is suggesting is that fees should reduce over time. So the big difference between that and a tax is that tax never reduce over time. I think we're all, you know, there has to be a huge political movement to reduce income taxes and it's extraordinarily difficult. To reduce a carbon tax or reduce a GST or anything, it almost never happens. And, but, but with fees, um, they would be reducible over time. So as the, um, the ecosystem comes back into balance, then the fees can be reduced. So that's the key difference and why it should be attractive to the users, the legislators, and indeed the polluters. Step seven is just the same thing that you would do in a normal firm, which is to monitor your results. So private property firms, for-profit firms measure their results and try to improve just as a steward would do. So that last sentence there, the common property system revolves around stewards, just as ever since the Industrial Revolution, the private property system revolves around for-profit corporations. It's an, it's an analogy, and in an analogy, we have at least some confidence that there's, uh, uh, th there's a way that it can work. Just tying it to coal seam gas a little, um, for instance, um, uh, 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 if there was a steward involved, then they would charge the producers and or the farmers for whatever use of the benefits of the water or the salts uh, they, were, they were doing. They would pay a fee to the steward and the steward would manage the way that waters would, would be used or the salts disposed of. Key to it is that fees would reduce over time. So coming to um, three concluding, concluding slides. Um, we've been uh, very keen to make sure that we've gone to a degree of analysis that aims towards a root cause. And so these four, four concluding remarks are around that. So I, I will read them out to you. The root cause of the inability to, to solve sustainability problems through prodigious effort, in other words, all of those steps that you saw in that, uh, that graph, is the high transactions cost for common property. The hypothesis at the moment is that this is the main economic root cause, 
It derives from transaction cost theory, property rights theory, and analogy to the Industrial Revolution, and of course that work by Hernando de Soto. The root cause cannot be resolved by price-orientated solutions like taxes and cap and trade because they do not lower transactions costs, they only change prices. That one to me is a key, a key point. Most people would think if you want to internalise externalities, is you put a price system into, the, into place. That's, that's the, common, the common understanding of how it should work. But if you don't go to root causes, then all you do is change prices. You actually don't lower transactions costs, so you don't take inefficiencies out of the system. So it can never reduce over time. <clears throat> Finally, there's a hypothesis that the root cause can be resolved by a comprehensive common property rights system because it does radically lower those transactions costs. This is a graph of the uh, um, ecological footprint. Many of you, if you've been connected with the sustainability world for any time, will have seen this, no doubt. And uh, the green balloons are our additions to uh, to what's produced by uh, by UNEP, uh, by um, I'm sorry, by e ecological footprint. Um, and unfortunately, it shows an, an ex, you know a rise in the uh, in the number of planets we need to sustain uh, the, the the human human race, the human society. And despite all of those wonderful summits and uh, other things, the, the, it's had no, no effect. Now, I've got to tell you, as a business manager, if I was given, if this was a cost curve going up and up, and I was given the job here to, uh, to make sure we didn't go into, uh, in, into costs being more than, um, than income, and uh, I managed to do that, I'd be a hero for about two years or a year or so, but I would then be losing my job pretty quickly. No one's losing their job because of that. And uh, I think that for anybody that's been associated with the sustainability movement, uh, they, they get very worried about this graph. Bringing the environment or the commons into the economic system is probably the only thing that we can do to make things better than that. Uh, we can talk about excess population and all those sorts of things, but fundamentally bringing the commons into the, uh, the economic system is probably the only way we can do it. Common property rights is perhaps just one small way that we can do that. So finally, um, the points on the right there for me. Um, we now need to move the research into proof of hypotheses. I think there is a reasonable case to be made that VCAD is a good platform or a springboard but, uh, but needs improvement. Um, we believe that our research shows that uh, um, a common property management system is required and that it would outperform taxes and trading schemes. And uh, I think that there are opportunities in Australia. We, we, we've, we've focused on Australia and the United States as the, the places. Um, but I think uh, it may very well be that coal seam gas would be an opportunity or perhaps sugar or some combination. I'm going to um, end there and thank you all for listening uh, and invite uh, any questions that you have.